And here we are in Colossians, again, one of the favorite Protestant uh, scriptures which they call upon every time they think that that's the basis for abolishing God's law or that that is something that the Apostle Paul wrote with the intention to abolish the law of God. First, let us see Colossians chapter 1 verse 18, which says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that all, in all things he might have the preeminence. Now, I'm quoting this scripture because there are some, and I think increasingly around the world there are many, who say that this verse teaches that Christ was born again. Well, the firstborn in this verse is a title to an only child. Christ is the head of the body, the one with preeminence. So firstborn shows preeminency. As we know, the house of Israel was chosen, it was a nation which had a special owner apart from all the nations. We read in Exodus chapter 4 verse 22, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So are we getting now finally the meaning of this verse? Colossians 1.18 So firstborn or first begotten shows exalted position, preeminence. It is a title of honor not of order or rank. In Hebrews 1, verse 6, we read that, But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. So that's the explanation of Colossians 1, 18. Let's go now to Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Colossians 2, 14, it says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way nailing to his cross now does this mean that Christ blotted out the law and nailed it to the cross nailed it to his cross this is what, that is what many Protestants most Protestants uh, an overwhelming majority of Christians around the world do believe well ok did he blot out the law and nail it to the cross no Christ did not blot out the law he blotted out the as it says in the verse handwriting of ordinances that is something quite different what is handwriting of ordinances well this could not refer to the law of God because God's law is not against us and contrary to us as it says in this verse there is Colossians chapter 4 uh, chapter 2 sorry verse 14 it, because the law is not against us and it's not contrary to us because in Romans 7 verse 12 it says that the law is holy and the commandment, holy and just and good. And David also said in Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how love I thy law, it is my meditation all the day. So God's law does not hurt us. God's laws, in plural, do not hurt us. They help us. In Psalm 19, verse 11, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them is great reward. The context explains what ordinances Paul is referring to. So he's not referring to the law of God because he kept the same law. Just like did the original apostles, just like did the early church, just like did Jesus Christ when he was in the flesh on this earth. The context explains what ordinances Paul is referring to. Colossians 2 verse 8 is the context. Colossians 2 verse 8, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And then we see more of this context in verses 20, 21, and 22. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ, from the rudiments of the world, now this is the punchline, rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all, are all to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, not the doctrines of God, those are commandments and doctrines of men. So what kind of ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, in other words, it is asceticism, stoicism, Catholicism, Meatless Fridays, vegetarianism, it certainly does not, does not mean the Ten Commandments. It cannot mean the feasts where people ate 
and drank and danced vigorously. Obviously not. It can't mean the sacrificial law because the priest had a great portion of meat and also had to handle and slaughter animals, you see. So this was a lusty way of life. So this touch not, taste not, handle not, those commandments and doctrines of men have nothing to do with the commandments of God. The Greek words for handwriting of ordinances are, this is a very a complex word, I'll try to pronounce it, chero grafo to is dogmasin. And this means the note of guilt from keeping man's laws. Cherograph graphon cherographon uh according to the Greek lexicon by Perk Crust means the following Anything written with the hand, a bond, note of hand, it signifies a sort of note under a man's hand whereby he obliges himself to the payment of any debt. In other words, a note of debt or a note of guilt. In the same lexicon by Park Parkhurst one of the meaning given for tois is from tois and the word dogma sin simply refers to law. You can see strong concordance, the word dogma sin. So in this case it refers to the laws of men as proved in I just said as proved in this previous point. So for the complexity's sake, let me just uh, Repeat what I've just said. So the Greek words for hand re- handwriting of ordinances are cherographon tois dogma sin, and this means the note of guilt from keeping man's law or laws, whether singular or plural, it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with the law or the laws of God. Cherographon, according to Greek lexicon, means anything written with the hand, a bond note of hand. In other words, a note of debt or a note of guilt. Also, the word tois is from, and dogma sin simply refers to law. So, in this case, it refers to the laws of man, as we have proven. Now, the note of guilt is what? It's our sins. We have sinned by obeying the laws and customs of men rather than God. What Christ blotted out is our sins. He didn't blot out the laws of God for sure, because he himself kept them. He came to fulfill them and give us an example of how to follow his example while he was living on the earth in this flesh. Now the law was not nailed to the cross. Christ was nailed to. So the law was not nailed to the cross. It was Christ who was nailed to the cross. We read about that in John 19 verse 18 and in John 20 verse 25. And he was made sin for us, as it says in Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. So our sins, he was made sin for us, which means that our sins were nailed to the cross in his body, as it says in First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Now Colossians 2.15 shows what Christ defeated. No, it was not the law of God. Let's read Colossians 2.15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. The principalities and powers referred to here are the same as the spiritual wickedness or wicked spirits in high places mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, which means demons. So he was not, he did not defeat the law, he defeated demons, the principalities and powers. And by making possible the forgiveness of sin, Christ defeated the purpose of Satan and his demons. He made it possible for sons to be born into God's family. Now, only two things were nailed to the stake at Golgotha. Only two things. The physical body of Jesus Christ. And secondly, the note of guilt. The record of our sins which Christ paid for himself in this sacrifice of his own life. And therefore, no laws of any kind were nailed to the stake. No legal laws, nor ceremonial, sacrificial or any other. So, so much for your twisted Protestant logic. That Jesus Christ, you know, supposedly 
nailed the law to the cross. It has nothing, this verse has nothing to do with the laws of God. Just like the next two verses in Colossians chapter 2 verses 16 and 17. In fact, not only does not abolish the law, in fact, it gives us an endorsement of the law and encourages us to keep <laughs> what is part of God's law. Colossians 2 verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you. It doesn't say let no God judge you. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holiday or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. Well, you know, somewhat vague, hard to understand, that's why this is the difficult scripture. As the Apostle Peter wrote, one of those scriptures that our brother Paul writes about in his difficult, perhaps, manner, and it is hard for people to understand, and therefore those who are unlearned and untaught twist to their own destruction as they do with the rest of the scriptures. So Colossians 2 verse 16 and 17, this is a passage frequently cited in an effort to show what has been nail, uh, abolished by Christ, what has been nailed, you know, to the stake, what has been abolished by Christ. Well, let us now finally uh, uh, take apart this passage and let us finally understand so, according to that interpretation, Paul's list in meat or in drink or in respect of a holiday or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days is a reminder of what is no longer in force. That's the typical nominal Christian interpretation. However, this interpretation is clearly wrong because Christ's death did not put an end to eating and drinking or to keeping his <laughs> God's holidays. The New Testament contains adequate references to the followers of Christ after Christ's death and resurrection, eating and drinking. And to see how positively the New Testament speaks about God's holidays, one has only to read the account of what took place on the first feast of Pentecost after Christ's death. And you have the account of that in Acts chapter 2. So his death did not end eating, drinking, holiday keeping, Sabbath keeping. In other words, to fully understand this section of scripture, we must look at it in light of its background and context. One of the reasons the Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the followers of Christ at Colossae was a disturbing report he had received. The faith of some was being undermined by a heresy. Certain Jewish Christians had fallen prey to early Gnostic teachings. As a result, they contended that Jesus Christ was not the center of God's plan of salvation. They dishonored Christ by seeking to approach God another way. And according to them, the followers of Christ trying to reach God through Christ were presumptuous. Such followers of Christ needed to lower their view these misguided teachers claim and seek the mediation of more easily accessible angelic beings to reach beyond Christ to the Supreme God. You see that in Colossians chapter 2 verse 18. Now part of this process was a measure of self-abasement or asceticism which is mentioned in verse 23. And this included strict regulations in matters of eating and drinking, as well as burdensome do's and don'ts regarding the observance of the holidays, new moons, and Sabbath days, as you see in verse 16, and also in verse 20 and in verse 21. The Apostle Paul had declared that such philosophy, he mentions that word in verse 8, that such philosophy was in error. It consisted of commandments and doctrines of men. In verse 22, he says that. Paul's answer to the ascetic context of the Colossian heresy is that such matters are to perish with the using. The sense of this, uh, you know, year is similar to that, uh, the sense of this uh, verse, sorry, is similar to that conveyed in Matthew 15, 17 and 1 Corinthians 6, verse 13. There is no moral value in prohibitions enjoined for purposes of asceticism. And not only that, but uh, one can imagine how 
you know, uh, insane, the Colossian heresy was in attempting to hold on to anything mentioned in here in Colossians 2, chapter 16. You know, as Paul points out with logical force, what is the point of subjecting oneself to decrees of any sort after the fullness of Christ has been set aside? And in this context, the decrees or ordinances were of human origin and gave only an appearance of wisdom and knowledge. In reality, they had nothing to do with a knowledge of God's law or God's plan of salvation, which are fully accounted for in Christ. Paul is not saying that there was no value in obeying God's law, not at all. He is saying that any act one could care to mention, circumcision, keeping new moons, Sabbath, etc., which he mentions in uh, passage from verse 11 through verse 17. So any uh, such act one could care to mention cannot replace or transcend Jesus Christ. Only Christ, with his sacrifice, is able to nail every person's spiritual debt to the cross, as it says in verse 14. And because of that, because only Christ with his sacrifice is able to nail every person's spiritual debt to the cross, thus triumphing over all principalities and powers, as we already mentioned, triumphing over the demons and his and Satan and, and subverting their purpose. And their purpose is to destroy humanity. Its purpose to destroy humanity, to keep humanity enslaved to sin. And that the wages of sin is death. So keep humanity enslaved to sin, and as a result to have humanity all to die. But no, God sacrificed sent his son to, you know to sacrifice his own life for humanity so that humanity would be redeemed from eternal death. So whatever had power over man's spiritual life, whether an order of angels or an ascetic ascetic principle, was already superseded by Christ. He was now the head from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints, ligaments, grows with the increase which is from God. Colossians 2 verse 19. Now, the judging that was going on at Colossae was actually misguided. The judging we, we see and we read about in verse 16. In any case, the force of this verb, to judge, is not negative. It does not mean condemn. Indeed, how could any member at Colossae prevent others from condemning him? The force of the above verb is that the Colossians could do something about this problem. It means, don't allow any to take you to task. So the matters listed, despite the claims of the Colossian heretics, could not transcend Christ, who is now the body, the substance, the very center of God's plan of salvation. All else is a mere shadow that holds no value as a replacement for Christ. After all, the Colossians were members of the very body of Christ. So the heretics then were ignorantly trying to push the church at Colossae out of the light and into shadows. Even God's law had a shadow of the good things to come. And even so, it could not make those who approach it perfect, as it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. The Colossian heresy, dear friends, then can be seen in context to have been caused by Jewish Christians who had fallen prey to early Gnostic teachings. Paul, in turn, addressed this local problem directly by centering the minds of the Colossians on the completeness and fullness in which they shared as members of the body of Christ. Jesus Christ is the total and complete way to God, as he says in verse 10 and in verse 9. In him... The spiritual, Y-O-U, a document acknowledging a debt that we just explained. The doc, a document acknowledging a debt in his, so in him, the spiritual document acknowledging, acknowledging a debt of our sins, awkwardly translated handwritings of requirements or ordinances in verse 14. Well, that document is blotted out. So, you know, Jesus Christ transcends all the all the things, you know, Jesus Christ transcends all. That's what Paul says in Colossians 2 verse 15. And therefore, the followers of Christ at Colossae were not to let themselves be taken by heretical teachers 
concerning matters such as eating, drinking, holidays, new moons and Sabbaths. After all, how could such matters possibly transcend Christ? You know, He is the body, the substance, the very center of God's plan of salvation. All else is a mere shadow that holds no value as a replacement for Him, as Paul clearly points out in verse 17. Now the word is, is in italics, in verse 17. So it is in italics, and that means that it is not in the original text. Therefore, verse 17 should read, Let no man therefore judge you, but the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church of God, as we see in verse 18. And it is the church that is our pillar and ground in the truth, as we read in First Timothy chapter three, verse fifteen, and the church is us and our standard. So that's our pillar, grounding our standard, not the ideas of men. So who cares, in other words, what other men think about us eating, drinking, feasting, while we keep the holidays, the Sabbath, and while we enjoy life? Who cares about that? That's that's the point. Well, Gnostics and Ascetics would care about it in, back in those days, as they would in these in these modern days in which we are living. So again, the word judge in verse 16 is better rendered, call you in question. The Gentile Colossians previously knew nothing of God or of his holidays. So Paul taught the followers of Christ at Colossae to observe the Sabbath and the holidays and outsiders called them in question for doing so. The ascetics in Colossae saw those in the church eating and drinking, feasting on the holidays, and despised them for it. That's the context of this verse. And these holidays are shadows of things to come. That's actually the true translation. They're shadows of things to come. They picture the major events in God's master plan to bring all mankind to salvation. Therefore, Paul is telling the Colossians and the Colossian converts to let no man call them in question for their observance of God's holidays. And of course, including, he also tells them not to let any man call them in question for observance of the Sabbaths as well. Uh, We see that they obviously observe the new moons. We as the Church of God don't observe the new moons for the simple reason that in Numbers chapter 10, the only instruction we have is that on the new moons were to sound shofar, to sound the trumpets, and to announce that the new moon has come. There is no any other commandment, uh, such as holy having holy convocation or having services and so on. And therefore, some of us Christians today, as we as the new moon would approach, we would just blast our shofars in our homes, and uh, we would remind one another that the next month in God's sacred calendar has begun. In any case, again, this passage in the Bible, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, has nothing to do with the law of God, and even less has to do with uh, abolishing the law of God. No, it is the Apostle Paul who is actually encouraging Christians, new converts, Gentile converts, to continue keeping God's law and not allowing any men to call them in question for the manner in which they kept God's law with feasting on holidays, feasting, eating, drinking on the Sabbath, uh, obviously eating, drinking perhaps when the new moon arrived, and so on. So, my dear friends, you are and I am commanded to keep God's law, which has not been abolished, not by Jesus Christ, nor by the apostles, and certainly not by the Apostle Paul.